What's up, my precog people? I'm Michael Princhek. In this video, we're going to talk about topics 2.1 and 2.2, change in arithmetic and geometric sequences, which is the same thing as change in linear and exponential functions. Now, this is a two-part video. In this first part, we're going to talk about arithmetic sequences, which you're about to find out are very similar, if not the same, as linear functions. In the second part, we're going to focus on geometric sequences, which are very, very similar, if not the same, to exponential functions. All right, let's get ready to dive right into the world of sequences. A sequence is simply just a list of numbers that have some type of pattern to them. But how you generate that list is, well, through a function. So a sequence is a function from the whole numbers to the real numbers. Now what that means is that when you're working with a sequence, you can only plug in whole numbers for your inputs. So if you want to find the first term of your sequence, you plug in one. If you want to find the second term, you plug in two. If you want to find the third term, you plug in three. Now a function, you can plug in negative three, negative four, 1.5, 1.7, but for a sequence, we cannot do that. For a sequence, the domain is only whole numbers. So again, a sequence is just a list of numbers that have a pattern to them, but to produce the terms of that sequence, we could use a function, but the domain of that function, the inputs of that function is limited to only the whole number. So again, very, very simple. Now, how we define this is, of course, using function notation, or we could use what's kind of called sequence notation. So we all know function notation is f of n, right? So n is the input. You put n into the function, you get an output. Well, in sequence notation, we use a letter like a and then a sub n. All that means is a sub n is a formula for any term of the sequence we want. And if you want to find the first term, you plug in 1. You want to find the 50th term, you plug in 50. So there's really no difference between these two different notations, with the only key difference being that the domain of a sequence is only those whole numbers only positive whole numbers. But again, these two forms are really the exact same thing. It's just understanding that are we working with a function where we can plug in anything we want, or are we working with a sequence where we can only plug in positive whole numbers. Now, when it comes to the graph of a sequence, what you're going to see is basically a bunch of discrete dots, a dot at each point. One, two, three, four. There's nothing in between one and two because you're not allowed to plug in anything in between one and two. You're only allowed to plug in one, you're allowed to plug in two. So whereas a function, we might see a nice continuous curve because there's a whole bunch of inputs we could use, all real numbers. The inputs for a sequence are only positive whole numbers. So we're going to see a dot at 1, a dot at 2, a dot at 3, a dot at 4, and so forth. So pretty simple to understand the difference. I mean, essentially, a function and a sequence are very, very similar. They generate values, right? You put inputs in and you get outputs out. The key difference, of course, as I said for maybe the fifth time, is that for a sequence, you can only plug in those positive whole numbers. Now let's look at a couple of examples. So imagine a sequence 11, 15, 19. And you may say, well, okay, I can already kind of see the pattern. We're going up four, up four, up four. Yeah, there it is. Very, very simple. But what would a function be to generate that sequence? Well, here it is, 4n plus 7. So we could use function notation f, um, f of n, or we could use the sequence notation a sub n representing any term we want. But again, for a sequence, we can only plug in positive whole numbers. So we plug in 1 to get the first term. 4 times 1 plus 7 is 11. Plug in 2 to get the second term of 15, plug in 3 to get the third term of 19. So as a sequence, this is just a list of numbers, 11, 15, 19, the first term, the second term, the third term, and of course that goes on and on forever. And then for a actual graph, if we wanted to plot these, these terms, we'd have points 1 comma 11, 2 comma 15, 3 comma 19. Here's a second example where we see a sequence that's defined as 3 times 2 raised to the n. And again, you could use function notation or you could use the sequence notation. But again, you just have to make sure you understand if this is a sequence, I can only plug in those positive whole numbers. So of course, I plug in 1 to get the first term of 6, 2 to get the second term of 12, 3 to get the third term of 24. And if I wanted to get the 49th term, I would just simply plug in 49 and get a really, really big number. But again, that's how simple it is. So as a sequence, we would just list these as, as, as a list of numbers, right? 6, 12, 24, and the next term would be 48. You could probably figure out the pattern pretty quickly there. We're simply multiplying by 2. But as points for our graph, we would have these set points, 1, 6, 2, 12, 3, 24. And there would be nothing in between these points because we're not allowed to plug in anything in between 1 and 2. And for our last example here, we see a sequence that's defined as 4n minus n squared. And again, this is a formula to find any term we want. And I always tease kids, any term, a sub n, any, right? A n, a n y spells any, a n, okay, you get the point. So anyway, if I want to find the first term, plug in one, 
two to fund the second term, three to fund the third term, four to fund the fourth term, and then we just get a sequence of numbers, three, four, three, zero. Really, really, really simple, not overly difficult, Colt. All you gotta understand is that key difference between a function and the old function and a sequence, sequence, inputs, domain, could only be those positive whole numbers. Now, there are three different types of sequences out there. First, we have arithmetic sequences. Second, we have geometric sequences. And third, we have, well, all other sequences. Now, when it comes to comparing these different types of sequences to functions, it's really, really easy to understand the comparisons. Arithmetic sequences are just like linear functions. The only difference is what you're allowed to plug in. Geometric sequences are just like exponential func functions. The only difference is which you're allowed to plug in. And well, all other sequences would relate to all other functions other than linear or exponential. Now, it's really important that you guys understand that linear functions increase or decrease at a constant rate. Well, that's exactly what an arithmetic sequence does. It increases or decreases at a constant rate. And if you know anything about exponential functions, they increase or decrease proportionally. And that's exactly what happens in a geometric sequence. They increase or decrease at a proportional rate. All right, now let's spend the rest of this video really focusing on arithmetic sequences. And then in part two of this video, you're gonna learn about geometric sequences. Now, arithmetic sequences, successive terms in an arithmetic sequence have a common difference, which means when I go from term one to term two, from term, ter two, term two to term three, term third, three to term four, I'm fumbling over here, is that I see a common difference between every single term. Really, really, really simple. We call this common difference D, but this common difference D would be very, very similar to the slope of a linear function. It's what we go up or go down by at that constant rate. Now let's take a look at a formula to generate an arithmetic sequence. Now, in this formula, I'm gonna be honest, it looks a little bit confusing at first, but let me explain. First, this is a general formula of an arithmetic sequence to find any term we want, a sub n, any term we want. You wanna find the 50th term, you plug in 50. All right, here's how the formula works. We start off with a sub k, add d, that's the common difference, times n minus k. Now, d is the common difference that our terms are changing by. Could be a positive if we're going up, could be a negative if we're going down. Now, what's k in us a sub k? Well, that is any term you want, literally any term you want. So if you want to use the third term, k is three, a sub k is the value of the third term. But you could be like, well, no, I want to use the 50th term. Okay, then k would be 50, and a sub k would be the value of the 50th term. So essentially, to build the formula, of an arithmetic sequence to find any term you want, you need two things. You need the common difference, what you're changing by for every successive term, and you need any term you want, any term. You just need one, any term. Could be the first term, could be the 50th term, could be the 13th term, doesn't matter. And that's what k and a sub k represent. K is the term value, A sub K is the value. Now, I know that this looks a little bit weird and may seem a little bit wonky, but let's actually put it to use because it's really, really, really simple. All right, here is our first example of a sequence. 11, 15, 19, 23, 27. So the first thing we have to do is determine what is the common difference? What is it that we're changing by? And of course, we're going up four, up four, up four, up four. So our common difference D is four. That'd be like the slope of a linear function. It's going up four every single point, which means it's kind of a constant rate of change. Now, to build the formula, we need that common difference, four, and then we need any term, doesn't matter. We actually know five terms. We know the first, the second, the third, the fourth, and the fifth, doesn't matter. So let's just say we use the third term. Again, it's totally up to you which term you pick. So I'm gonna use the third term, which I clearly see is 19. So I'm gonna use my formula, start off my formula. I'm gonna substitute four in for D, that's the common difference. Since I'm using the third term, I'm gonna substitute three in for K, and the value of that third term is 19, so I'm gonna substitute 19 in for A sub K. And that's it, that's my formula. Now the only thing I could do next is kind of clean it up. I could distribute that four to get a four n minus 12. Then I could combine my like terms, the 19 and the minus 12 and get a seven. So I get this final equation of a sub n equals four n plus seven and kind of looks like a linear function, doesn't it? Well, it is. Exactly arithmetic and linear functions are the exact same thing. The only difference is with the sequence, you can only plug in those positive whole numbers. Now in the form 4n plus seven, the four is our constant rate of change and the seven is like our initial term, right? There is no zeroth term, right? All sequences start with the first term. But if there was a zeroth term, 
before the first term. That's what that seven would represent. Now, I want to make sure you understand, as I said, you could pick any term you want. You don't have to use the third term like I did. So let's actually use the fifth term, which is 27. So in this case, we're going to start off with our formula again. We're going to plug in four for the common difference. We're going to plug in five for K because we're using the fifth term. 27 is the value of that fifth term. That goes where the A sub K is. And then again, we want to clean this up, distribute the four. We get four N minus 20. Combine the like terms of 27 and negative 20, and we get seven. So notice we get the exact same final result. 4n plus 7, even though we used a different term. Really, really simple, not overly complicated, nice and easy. All right, let's look at one more example. In this next example here, we see a sequence of negative 17, negative 89, negative 103, negative 117. So the first thing we have to figure out is what the heck is our common difference? What are we changing by every single term? And that is negative 14. We're going down 14, down 14, down 14 between any two consecutive terms. All right, now we could use any term we want. Again, it really doesn't matter. Let's use the second term. So I'm going to substitute into my formula, negative 14 for D. Now the formula does have a plus D, but now it's going to become a minus 14 because it's negative. Our K value is two because we're looking at the second term and the value of that second term is the negative 89. Then all we have to do is a little bit of distribution. So don't mess up the algebra there. Combine like terms and we get negative 14N minus 61. Again, a linear function. Now, again, in this form, negative 14n minus 61, the negative 14 represents our constant rate of change, our constant difference, and the negative 61 represents the initial value, the, the value of the zeroth term if there was one. There really technically is no zeroth term, but if there was a term before that first term, that's what that negative 61 would represent. As so as I've already said multiple times, arithmetic sequences and linear functions are the same, just different representations. It's how we write it, right? We, we could use 4x plus 7 or 4n plus 7. We could say, hey, here is a function of x, f of x. We could say, here is a sequence, a sub n, a formula to find any term we want. Now, the main difference is really in that domain, right? A sequence, we can only use those positive whole numbers, whereas a function, especially a linear function, you can plug in any value you want. There's no limit. Any number can plug in to a linear function. So again, really understand that these two things are the exact same thing is really, really important. Now, let's really prove how similar these are by basically kind of looking at the two formulas. I want you to understand that they're actually the same. So here on the left-hand side, we see our formula for an arithmetic sequence that we already went over. Now, remember, we only need two things. D, that's the common difference, our constant rate of change. And then we need any one term. K is the, the, the term we're looking at. And then A sub K is the value of that term. So again, we'd use the first term or we use the second term. You could use the 13th term, doesn't matter. Now, when it comes to a linear function, you probably remember point slope form. Now remember what you need in point slope form. You need the slope. That's our constant rate of change, what we call m, but that's the same thing as d in an arithmetic sequence. And then we need any one point, input, output. Well, isn't that the exact same thing as a sequence where we need any one term? Exactly. They're literally no different. When you start to actually look at them, they're the exact same thing. The only thing I did to our point slope form is typically it starts off with y minus our y value equals m times x minus our x value. I just added that initial y value over to make it look like our arithmetic sequence. So again, d and m are the exact same thing. They're our constant rate of change. And then whether you have your, your first term where k is 1 and a sub k is the value of that first term, or you have any x value, x x sub i, and then the y value that corresponds to that x value, it's really the exact same thing. So whether you're working with an arithmetic sequence or a linear function, you got yourselves the exact same thing. Now, it's important that you remember the definition of a linear function. Over any equal length input value interval, we have a constant rate of change. Well, that's the exact same definition of an arithmetic sequence between any two consecutive terms. So we look at the third term and the fourth term or the 19th term, the 20th term or the 49th term and the 50th term, we see a constant rate of change. Now, one more thing. If you go all the way back to when you learned about linear functions back in algebra one, maybe even pre-algebra, you remember that to generate a 
linear function, you only need two things, two points. Well, the exact same thing is true when it comes to generating an arithmetic sequence. We just went through how to generate an arithmetic sequence when we knew the common difference in any one term, but we can also do this if we just know two terms. It's one of two functions in the entire world that can be generated by only knowing two points or two terms. So here are two points or two terms, right? We can look at this as a linear function with two points, two comma negative five, 10 comma seven, or we can look at this as an arithmetic sequence where we know the second term is negative five and the 10th term is seven. It's really the same thing. But with this information, we can generate our formula. Now, let's look at this through the eyes of a linear function. What would you do first with two points? Well, the first thing you would do is find that constant rate of change, aka the slope between them. So you'd subtract your y's on top, seven minus negative five, your x's on the bottom, 10 minus two, you'd take 12 divided by eight, reduce it, and you get three halves or 1.5 as your constant rate of change. Then you'd use point slope form. You know the slope, 1.5, and you need one of the two points. You have two points, you only need one of them, doesn't matter which one you use. So let's use the two common negative five. It truly doesn't matter. So the point slope formula is y minus our y coordinate of negative five equals our slope of 1.5 times x minus our x coordinate of two. And all we gotta do is just do a little bit of distribution, combine like terms, um, move that five over, and boom, we got a final answer of negative, excuse me, positive 1.5x minus eight. It's really that simple. You guys should know to do that from algebra. But in terms of arithmetic sequences, guess what? It's the exact same thing. So let's look at this exact same problem through the eyes of an arithmetic sequence. All right, so we have two terms, the second term, which we know is negative five, and the 10th term, which we know is seven. Now, how can I find the common difference when I don't know consecutive terms? Right? And I know consecutive terms, I just gotta find the difference between them. Well, all I gotta do is think for a second. If I am at the second term and I wanna get to the 10th term, I need eight differences, right? It would take eight differences to get from the second term to that 10th term. So the second term, a sub two, plus eight differences would lead me to that 10th term. Well, I'm using the second term and the 10th term because I know them. The second term is negative five. The 10th term is seven. Now I can actually plug those values in and simply solve for the value D. Again, it should make complete sense. If the 10th, you know, if, if the second term is negative five and I need to get to that 10th term, which is seven, it's going to take me eight differences to get there. So add the five over, seven plus five is 12, divide by the eight. Hey, notice what I get as my common difference. 1.5, the same thing I got earlier when I treated this as a linear function with my slope. Then, now that I have my common difference, I need any one term. You could use the second term or you could use the 10th term. Remember, you're allowed to use any term you want. Let's go ahead and use the second term. So the formula for any term I want, a sub n, is going to be subbing in 1.5 for the d, subbing in two for the k because I'm using the second term, and then subbing in negative five, that's the value of the second term, and cleaning it up, distributing the 1.5, combining like terms, and I get 1.5n minus eight. The same thing I got when I treated this as two points of a linear function. Now, the only difference between the sequence notation and the function notation is, of course, for a sequence, I'm only allowed to plug in positive whole numbers to get my outputs. For a linear function, <laughs> you can plug in anything you want. All right, that's it for understanding arithmetic sequences. Overall, pretty simple. They are really much the same thing as linear functions, just what you're allowed to plug in, as I've said maybe 22 times in this video. But keep in mind to generate the formula for an arithmetic sequence, you either know need to know your common difference in any single term, or you need to know any two terms. And with those any two terms, you could, you could simply find your common difference, and then you could use any one of those two terms to find your formula for any term. And then once you have that formula, you can find any term you want, including the thousand term. All I gotta do is plug in a thousand. All right, that's it. Stay tuned for part two. Where I'm gonna cover geometric sequences, which are very similar to exponential functions.